A lot of people have been swayed to the Richard Floyd McCoy as D.B. Cooper camp. For a very brief period, I was one of those people, and I made a video about it stating that I thought he was the best candidate. Hi, this is Anthony. Welcome back to my show. As you can tell from the title of this video, I no longer believe that. And in fact, I made a subsequent video admitting that I had not been aware of some evidence which cast doubt on McCoy's guilt in the Cooper case. Let's briefly review some information about McCoy. Most of this is from Wikipedia, but from everything I've read from other sources, this seems to be accepted as accurate information. And the reason that I include this before I tell you why I don't think it's him is because there are many things that were thought about Cooper, such as him having skydiving experience and probably having military experience that McCoy had. Richard Floyd McCoy, 1942 to 1974, was an army veteran who served two tours of duty in Vietnam, first as a demolition expert and later with the Green Berets as a helicopter pilot. After his military service, he became a warrant officer in the Utah National Guard and an avid recreational skydiver with aspirations of becoming a Utah State Trooper. On April 7, 1972, McCoy staged the best known of the so-called copycat hijackings. He boarded United Airlines Flight 855, a Boeing 727 with aft stairs, in Denver, Colorado, and brandishing what later proved to be a paperweight resembling a hand grenade and an unloaded handgun. He demanded four parachutes and $500,000. After delivery of the money and parachutes at San Francisco International Airport, McCoy ordered the aircraft back into the sky and bailed out over Provo, Utah, leaving behind his handwritten hijacking instructions and his fingerprints on a magazine he had been reading. He was arrested on April 9th with the ransom cash in his possession and after trial and conviction, received a 45-year sentence. Two years later, he escaped from Lewisburg Federal Penitentiary with several accomplices by crashing a garbage truck through the main gate. Tracked down three months later in Virginia Beach, McCoy was killed in a shootout with FBI agents. In their 1991 book, D.B. Cooper, The Real McCoy, parole officer Bernie Rhodes and former FBI agent Russell Colome asserted that they had identified McCoy as Cooper. They cited obvious similarities in the two hijackings, claims by McCoy's family that the Thai and mother of Pearl Thai clip left on the plane belonged to McCoy, and McCoy's own refusal to admit or deny that he was Cooper. A proponent of their claim was the FBI agent who killed McCoy. Quote, when I shot Richard McCoy, unquote, he said, quote, I shot D.B. Cooper at the same time, unquote. Although there is no reasonable doubt that McCoy <clears throat> committed the Denver hijacking, the FBI does not consider him a suspect in the Cooper case because of mismatches in age and description, a level of skyjacking skill well above what was thought to be possessed by the hijacker, and credible evidence that McCoy was in Las Vegas on the day of the Portland hijacking and at home in Utah the day after, having Thanksgiving dinner with his family. Now I have to admit, that there is some dispute over that. Evidently, the alibi was corrob corroborated by his wife's sister, who was babysitting their kids, and the FBI believed her at the time. It sounds like at some point she may have changed her story, but the problem with that is if she's telling a different story than the one that she told before, then one of those stories is a lie, which makes her a liar, even if she's now telling the truth. So that muddies the water, but again, I want to just bring that up because it can tend to both incriminate and exonerate McCoy, whichever way you want to read into it. Now, most of us have not had the ability to read the book, The Real McCoy, due to an original lawsuit by McCoy's wife. Copies that were printed remain in circulation, but they are extremely rare and go for hundreds of dollars generally. More likely, if you know about this line of reasoning, you've perhaps seen a two-part series on YouTube by Dan Greider. The first one is called D.B. Cooper, Deep Family Secrets, Part 1. And then the next one is called D.B. Cooper, Deep FBI Secrets, Part 2. I'm not going to analyze those documentaries at this time. I may do that in a subsequent video. But the points that I'll make, I hope, rebut some of the arguments from the pro-McCoy camp. Okay, I'm going to start going through my reasons. A lot of these have been gleaned from various posts on Reddit. I believe them to be facts or to be accurate interpretations or conclusions based on known facts. 
I encourage you, the viewer, to always do your own research to search out for the most accurate facts, look at other people's conclusions about them, and decide whether they truly make logical sense to you. Okay, reason one, McCoy's face does not look like Cooper's. Let's look at the sketch artist's interpretations of Cooper based on the flight attendant's descriptions. And let's look at McCoy. Now, I'll admit that McCoy looks a little like Cooper, and again, all that we have about Cooper is what the flight attendants describe to the sketch artist. And McCoy's picture is a mugshot that was taken roughly six months after the Cooper hijacking. So, even though his sideburns are more prominent in the mugshot, they obviously had time to grow out if he was Cooper. I think more significantly, the hairline is different. I think there's marked difference in the eyes and especially in the narrow but thick eyebrows. But I think that the biggest difference that is quite striking is that McCoy's ears stick out so much. If Cooper's ears stuck out like those, the flight attendants would have noticed that. People's eyes, ears, hair, and teeth are often what other people really notice when the faces are otherwise fairly nondescript. I think the fact that there's such a glaring difference between McCoy's ears and Cooper's ears, in my mind, rules out one from being the other. In addition, and lastly on the appearance, usually when we see the sketch artist renderings of Cooper based on the stewardess's information, we see them in black and white. And in black and white, he looks like a middle-aged white man. However, if you look at the color versions, he's actually not depicted as being a light-skinned white man. And in fact, if you actually read up on the case, including the FBI file, the stewardess said that she believed that Cooper had Indian or Mexican blood. And again, those were terms used 50 years ago. And just to be clear, the term Indian meant Native American, not from the country of India. And the FBI reports the stewardess said that Cooper could have had Italian ancestry, and his eyes were reported to be brown. As far as McCoy, he is described as having pale skin, light gray, blue eyes. Again, not a match. And also look at the age estimate for Cooper based on his looks. It was about 45 to 50. I think you'll agree with me looking at the composite sketch that Cooper does in fact look about 45 to 50. Here's the interesting thing. Again, I don't think that McCoy was Cooper, but how old do you think McCoy is in the mugshot taken here? He actually was roughly 29 and a half. Again, I don't think that they're the same people, but I do think that McCoy looked older than his age. What do you think? What's the number two reason and just as strong as my number one? After McCoy was apprehended for the hijacking that he did commit over Utah, his picture was shown to the flight attendants. They were emphatic that McCoy was not Cooper. Evidently, this information was not released by the FBI to the public until fairly recently. Reason number three, Cooper was a chain smoker and drank alcohol. McCoy did not. In the hijacking of Flight 305, Cooper smoked what is believed to be eight cigarettes. Sometimes the number nine is used. He was also described as having nicotine stains on his fingers, which would indicate a chain smoker, besides the fact he smoked at least eight cigarettes while he was on the plane. And he had what was reported to be two bourbons. McCoy was a Mormon Sunday school teacher, and while certainly there are some Mormons who smoke cigarettes and some Mormons who drink alcohol, and certainly some Mormons who hijack planes or counterfeit documents and kill people with bombs, I've not seen any hard evidence that McCoy smoked and drank. From what I've read about his known hijacking on the FBI website, it did not mention McCoy smoking or drinking. Some researchers have suggested that McCoy, as Cooper, intentionally smoked and drank to throw off investigators, so they definitely would be looking for a Mormon. And in fact, early FBI analysis concluded that Cooper was likely not a Mormon or Baptist because of the smoking and drinking on Flight 305. It's one thing to sip on one drink or pretend to smoke one cigarette to throw off investigators, but everyone's understanding of Cooper's consumption of cigarettes was that he was in fact a chain smoker who was smoking them. Somebody who was not a smoker, I would argue, could under no circumstance sit there and smoke eight cigarettes without coughing violently and perhaps throwing up. I argue this excludes McCoy as Cooper. Reason number four. While some planning went into McCoy's confirmed hijacking, he made many mistakes 
and deviated from some of Cooper's actions. I think it's obvious that McCoy studied Cooper's hijacking in the newspapers and picked the same type of airliner and knew that if he claimed that he had a bomb or some other explosive device, in his case a paperweight that looked like a hand grenade plus a gun that was unloaded, that he could convince the airline to get ransom money for him and in fact that worked. However, there were a lot of differences between the two skyjackings and many mistakes were made by McCoy. Cooper was reported to have been very calm and polite. Any written communication that he had with the pilot, he made sure he got the notes back. McCoy was extremely nervous and ended up leaving one of the notes in the possession of the crew. He also read a magazine and fingerprints were obtained from the magazine. It's not clear if Cooper left any usable fingerprints. Supposedly there were 66 latent prints recovered but they may have all been smudged and not capable of being used to match against fingerprints in any type of governmental database. Later, McCoy's handwriting was confirmed to match notes, as well as the typewriter found in his residence in Utah was the one that had typed the ransom notes that were typed. If Cooper wore any type of makeup or disguise, it wasn't readily apparent. Prior to making the hijacking known to the crew, McCoy went into the bathroom put on a wig and make up the bled onto his shirt collar and was sweaty and nervous throughout the skyjacking. His demeanor was completely at odds with Ada Cooper. And reason five that Richard Floyd McCoy was not D.B. Cooper, well, it's not exactly a point that proves that he wasn't, but let's take into consideration a bunch of the other circumstantial evidence that's used to make the link. For instance, the authors of The Real McCoy, one was a former FBI agent and the other a former probation officer. Now, you don't really know why a probation officer would have any more authority in determining who a mystery skyjacker was than literally anybody else in the world. As far as the former FBI agent who co-wrote the book, I've seen him interviewed. He sincerely believes that McCoy was Cooper. The thing is, we have all seen various retired FBI agents interviewed about Cooper, and everyone has a different candidate that they favor. Or they admit that there's no one candidate that's been identified that can conclusively be, be determined to have been Cooper at the time based on existing evidence. And of course, the FBI basically has given up at this point on identifying a suspect. And they are all were well aware of the evidence against McCoy and chose not to pursue charging him with the Cooper crime because they realized that there was no evidence to tie the two cases together. Speaking of ties, if you listen to the McCoy partisans, they will tell you that a member of McCoy's family identified the tie and tie clip left behind by Cooper as belonging to McCoy. I assume that this was his wife who claimed that. I don't know who else would. But she's also the one who sued the authors of The Real McCoy, saying that her husband was not Cooper. It was also later determined that she was deeply involved in the second hijacking. It seems that McCoy's children now believe that their father was Cooper. I believe that they were something like two and four years old at the time. I'm sure that they're sincere in their belief. I don't know if they have any financial agreements with any type of current or future film projects, but certainly if they did, that may cast some shadow over whether they're an unbiased source on this. Again, I'm not suggesting that they're not being truthful, but it could be wishful thinking on their part. Also along the lines of the tie, this was a clip-on tie that was sold for just a few dollars in the late 1960s at J.C. Penney department stores. My guess is there were perhaps millions of these sold. Even if the identification of the tie being the same type that was owned by McCoy is accurate, it doesn't mean that that particular tie left behind was the one that had belonged to McCoy. And as I've pointed out in three or four previous videos, research done in the last couple decades has found among a hundred thousand particles lifted from the tie, many that are found in high-tech and or aerospace industries, including some particles of a potentially rare titanium alloy. As I pointed out in my previous videos, we need to be very cautious in trying to determine where those particles came from and who might have come into contact with them, but there seems to be no evidence supporting McCoy coming into contact with the wide range of industrial particles found on Cooper's tie. Okay, that's all I want to say for today. I think on the surface of it, when you watch one or two documentaries about McCoy, he can look like an excellent candidate because evidence to the contrary often gets left out of documentaries that focus on one particular candidate. 
We saw that with Brad Meltzer's documentary about Kenny Christensen, which I discussed and uploaded yesterday. If you still believe that McCoy did it, I don't think that you're stupid. When I watched the video about him, I was convinced that they finally found a great candidate. He certainly matches some of the features that one would expect Cooper to have in his background, such as a military background and some degree of skydiving experience. But when you compare those things that are known in the hijacking that McCoy actually executed with those things that are known in the Cooper hijacking, you just have too many differences, I believe, to say that you have the same individual committing both. But if you disagree, please do leave a comment and lay out your evidence that Cooper was in fact McCoy. I really do want to hear from you. Also, if you haven't already, I would really appreciate it if you hit the subscribe button and also click the like button for this video. I've made lots of Cooper videos. Each of them are different, so I encourage you to watch all of them and please look for new ones in the near future. Thanks again for watching.